cartoon producer Philip Mackey, who died earlier this year. He wrote many works for television, including The Naked Civil Servant and the series Maupassant and the Organization, which you'll be able to see in subsequent weeks. But first, some short stories by Hector Hugh Munro, who wrote under the pen name Saki. <laughs> is an intellectual pastime. Women who have no intellect should no more be allowed to play billiards. Than to get the vote or join this club. Agreed. I was about to say than to play auction bridge. I take it you've been visiting Lady Bastable. Oh, I've avoided that for years now. There's no pleasure in beating her at bridge and certainly no profit. As a player, she's lamentable. As a pair, non-existent. She owes me a good bit. Helena Bastable loves owing with a great strong love. To lose at cards and not to pay has a glamour for her that she simply cannot resist. In fact, I can only remember one occasion when she paid up without a murmur. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, was the work of Clovis Sangrail. Helena. More tea? No, thank you. Since I'm leaving this morning... Since you and your nephew Clovis are leaving this morning... I thought it would be rather nice if Clovis stayed on here with you. Clovis? Stay here with me. Not permanently. You are taking him up north to visit the McGregors. I particularly don't want to. Why not? He would teach the McGregor boys poker patience. And what will he do here? He could hardly teach you poker patience in the time. He would only be here six days. It would seem considerably longer. The last time he was here for a week... But that was two years ago. He was much younger then. Two years younger. He hasn't improved. What's the use of getting older if you only learn new ways of misbehaving? No, thanks. I'd rather not. Helena, if you'll have Clovis here, I'll cancel our bridge account. What bridge account? Forty-nine shillings. Fifty if you prefer it in round figures. Naturally, I don't prefer it, as I am the one who owes it. But it can't matter, can it, since it's been cancelled? The boys' train fare to the north will cost you more than forty-nine shillings. You'll make a clear profit. And so will you. No. Clovis is an expensive guest. But the satisfaction of not having to pay a card debt, particularly a debt to me, I settled then. Good morning, Lady Bastable. Anne. Good morning, Clovis. Lady Bastable has some news for you. Oh, uh, another revolution. Which country is it now? She has very kindly asked you to stay on here while I go to the McGregor's. Really? <laughs> How nice. But uh, wouldn't it be a frightful imposition? Not at all. Lady Bastable will love having you. Provided you behave yourself. Oh, I shall. Uh, but I know Lady Bastable is an extremely busy person. Preparing for the end of the world, isn't it? The end of the world as we know it. Yes, I fancied you were getting ready for something of the sort. Hmm? I have been ready for years. We are on the brink of a social upheaval of titanic proportions. Of course, that was it. The masses will rise up and everybody will be killed. Everybody? By whom? By everybody else. Ah, yes, of course. We, our class, will naturally take precedence. We shall be the first to go. It's only a matter of time. Well, how long do you give us, sir? Another year or two? 1913, 1914? It'll come sooner than we think. Aunt, don't you think it might be safer for me up north? At no, the Clovis, you will stay here. None of us will escape wherever he may be. But I promised faithfully to teach the McGregor boys how to play poker patience. That's far too young for games of that sort. Well, if Lady Bastard was right, they're not going to get much older. It will come sooner than we think. You see. It's all settled, Clovis, and I'm relying upon you to behave yourself while you're there. Yes, Aunt. However unnatural it may seem. Have you uh, seen the morning papers, Lady Bastable? Why? Well, only that they're full of the most alarming news. Lithuanian peasants in revolt, aristocracy slaughtered in a wave of terror. Let me see. French workers on strike. Let me see. Near a home every moment. Aha! Aha! Aha, indeed.
Good gracious me, it's on its way. And sooner than anybody thinks. Twelve, twelve, everybody, come quickly. Poor Lady Bastard, oh, my God, it's terrible. Come as you are, I'm on a moment to be lost. Everybody, quick, on this way. We made it too late. What's happened? May I ask the meaning of this uproar, Clovis? Well, right, it's happened. The mob is upon us. What mob? It's a great social upheaval. Help, help, save us! We're trapped! Help, for Secure! Save us! No. Oh. Oh. It's as I thought! It's like the fall of the Bastille! I am ready. I tried to say goodbye to Lady Bastard, but I gather she's not feeling well. Clovis, dear, will you tell her? Why are you in travelling clothes? Oh, well, you see, Aunt... Clovis, it was definitely settled that you were remaining here while I go to the... Uh, oh, for me? So you may take your bag upstairs and unpack again. I have made an arrangement with Lady... Oh. What is it, Aunt? Good news? It's a cheque. A cheque from Lady Bastard. For 49 shillings. That was how the McGregor boys learned to play poker patience. After all, their father's very rich. They could afford to just. Very vexed problem, of course, this whole thing of women and money. I didn't know that you associated with either. Well, don't, in the normal course of events. But last weekend, I ran down to Brighton. Alone, I trust. Naturally alone. Thought I'd lunch at that new hotel on the front. When I got there, not a table to be had. Head waiter seemed a decent sort. Asked someone if she'd mind sharing. She. Decent of her, too, but... Damned embarrassing for me, I mean, but not my sort of thing. Good of you, madam. Not at all. Uh, well. <clears throat> I'll have the brown winter and the soup, sir. Uh, roast leg of mutton. Roast leg of mutton and the cabinet pudding, sir. And the cabinet pudding, sir. Mm. <clears throat> Lovely roses. Yes, Auntie. Do you know what they're called, by a chance? Yes. Amy Sylvester Partington. Oh. Thank you very much, madam. They're very... very colourful. It's really rather curious that I can tell you their name. Oh, why is that, madam? Because if you were to ask me my name, I wouldn't be able to give it to you. Well, I say, I'm sorry to hear that. I mean, are you suffering from loss of memory, something along those lines? Yes, I, I suppose I am. I was coming here in a train from Victoria, and suddenly my mind went blank. But you knew you were coming from Victoria? Well, I looked at my ticket. It told me. And you knew you were going to Brighton? Non-stop. But you see, I hadn't the vaguest notion why I was going, or who I was. No identification in your purse, for instance? Nothing. Is it awkward? All that I can recollect about myself is that I'm a lady. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> I mean, I have a title. You know, I'm a lady something or other. Beyond that, I have no idea. What made you come to this uh, particular hotel? Well, I knew I must be staying somewhere, but of course I couldn't remember where. Then I heard somebody give the name of this hotel to a taxi driver, so I followed suit. What about luggage? Oh, that was most embarrassing. I, well, I simply had to have luggage, of course. Of course. But I didn't know which my luggage was, because I didn't know what my name was. Uh, yes, I followed. So, as I was passing the luggage van, I told the porter to pick up the first two pieces he saw. Well, at least, the first two pieces that looked as if they might be mine. Uh, but they weren't yours. No. <laughs> the label said they belonged to a Mrs. Kestrel Smith. And you're not Mrs. Kestrel Smith? I couldn't possibly be in anything, Smith. No, I suppose not. Of course, it was dreadful arriving at a strange hotel with a name like that. But it would have been worth riding without luggage. I do hate causing trouble. Quite so. Uh, still, it's not quite the same thing as having your own luggage. Not at all the same. Um, but at least you have luggage. Mm. None of my keys fitted. But I told an intelligent page boy I'd lost my key ring, and he forced the locks in a twinkling. Forced them? But... Rather too intelligent, that page boy. 
Probably end in Dartmoor. Madam, I, I sympathise with your predicament. Oh, the Kestrel Smith toilet tools aren't up to much, but they're better than nothing. Yeah. Wait, I'd like my bill, please. If you're sure you have a title, why not get hold of a copy of Burke's Peerage and I, go right through it? I tried that. But a mere printed string of names conveys awfully little, you know. Yes, I don't say you're right. Mm, what I'm doing is trying to find out by various little tests who I'm not. Who oh, you're what? Who I'm not. Ah. Did you notice, for instance, that I lunched principally on Lobster Newburg? No, I'm afraid I was too late for that. It's an extravagance. But it proves I'm not Lady Starping. Oh, well, that's a very, how very interesting. Yes, you see, she never touches shellfish. And as for poor Lady Bradlefrob, <laughs> it would kill her. If that's who you are, I mean, if in fact you are Lady Bradlefrob, I shall die in agony this afternoon. And then, of course, the duty of finding out who I am will devolve on the press, and the police, and that sort of person. I shall be past caring. Rather drastic, huh? Now, I'm not Lady Newford, because I knew those roses were Amy Sylvester Partington, and she doesn't know one rose from another. And then she hates men, so she'd never have consented to your sitting here in the first place. Lady Mouse Hilton, on the other hand, flirts with every man she ever meets. I haven't flirted with you, have I? Oh, no, 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 dear, that's certainly not, not at all, no, no, no. <laughs> well, you see, that knocks four off the list right away. But won't it be rather a lengthy process, knocking the list down to one? Oh, well, there are heaps of people I couldn't possibly be, such as women who have grandchildren. I haven't got grandchildren, have I? Obviously not. No, I've only got to consider the women of my own age. Provided you can remember what your age is. I mean... I wonder if you could help me this afternoon. Oh, very well, but please do, if uh, I after, really think I... After luncheon, would you go into the lounge and look through back numbers of Country Life and Tatler and see if you'll come across my portrait? It'll only take an hour or so. Very well, be pleased to. Did you notice that I tipped the waiter a shilling? We can cross Lady Alwhite off the list. She'd have died rather than do that. She's staggeringly mean. <laughs> waiter! The soup is cold. Not a picture of you anywhere. Oh, dear. You're not Lady Tetbury? Oh, good. She's so plain. Yes, you're not Lady Siddington. I wouldn't dream of being Lady Siddington, even if I turned out to be. Uh, you're not... Well, you're not any of these. 125 of them. I've discovered something, too. Not your name, Madam. No. I've discovered I'm not Lady Bethnal. She disapproves of any form of gambling. You've been gambling? Yes. I put a tenor on an unnamed filly by William III out of Mitrovica on the 315. The fact that it was unnamed probably appealed to you. <laughs> Did it win? No. It came in fourth. The most irritating thing a horse can do when you've backed it to win or plays. Anyhow, at least I know I'm not Lady Vefnal. It strikes me that the knowledge was rather dearly bought. Well, yes. It cleared me out. You see, the lobster Newberg made my lunch very expensive. And then, of course, I had to tip that boy for breaking open the Kestrel Smith's luggage. You see, a florin is about what I've got left. And you're no nearer finding out who you are than before. No. But I just thought of something else. I feel certain that I belong to the Divot Club in Cavendish Square. Everybody belongs to the Divot Club these days. I shall go back to town and ask the porter if there are any letters for me. Ah, splendid. Then if there are, the whole problem will be solved, won't it? Yes, but what if there aren't? Well, I shall simply say, you know who I am, don't you? And he'll say, yes, of course, your lady. Mm -hmm. uh, so you'll find out anyway. Yes, I think the plan is a sound one. The only snag is, how am I to get back to town? Well, it must be a train before the day is out. Yes, but I told you, I'm down to Florian. Ah, oh, quite so, the wherewithal. Mm, what with my bill here, cabs and things, I shall certainly need ten pounds. I wonder... Oh, but of course, if you'd allow me, I'd be delighted. Though there's still the question of your luggage. My luggage? It's Kestrel Smith's, you mean. The Kestrel Smith's luggage, which you have. Well, I don't want to be saddled with that for the rest of my life. 
I'll tell you what you must do. Sneak up to my room, bring it down and put it somewhere in the lobby. Me? Tell it, I? Yes, and look, here's the key to my room. Oh, well, I suppose it'll be all right. Then they'll never know where it was, and they can do what they like, can't they? Oh, you're most kind. I'll let you have my name and address. Oh, why? So that you can... Uh, should you be so inclined to return the money, Lumen? Oh, God. <laughs> stupid of me. I'm Major Caterham, the Lotus Club, St. James's. I remember. Really, I, I don't know what I would have done without you. Well, let me know who you are when you find out. I'll be most interested. I promise you. Well, up you go for the luggage. Oh. Goodbye, and thank you again. Goodbye. Did you get your money back? Not a penny of it. Did you find out who the lady was? Oh, yes, I found out a damn sight sooner than I expected. My dear Major. Oh, hello, <laughs> I just ran into Mary Drakmanton. I gather you had lunch with her. Mary who? Mrs. Drakmanton. Well, I, I don't know Mrs. Drakmanton. <laughs> You just had lunch with her. Oh, well, I don't know who it was. And she isn't a Mrs. anybody. She's a lady something. Mary? She's not. Oh, I assure you, she has a title. Oh, yes, indeed she has a title. She's the Lady Crokey Champion. The, the Lady Crokey Champion? Charming woman. I'm devoted to her. Oh, there's just one thing I must warn you about the next time you meet her. She suffers from loss of memory every now and then due to a sharp tap on the head with a croquet mallet by an over-enthusiastic opponent a few years ago. It gets her into all kinds of fixes. She's absolutely furious if you make any allusion to it afterwards. She simply refuses to believe it happened. I beg your pardon, sir. I forgot to ask you before. Will you be here for dinner tonight? No, I shan't. You're not staying in the hotel, sir. No, I'm just down for the day. Then this is not your luggage, sir. No, it isn't. Kestrel Smith. I ask you, sir, what these pieces of luggage are doing in your possession. There's been a bit of a muddle. I'm trying to oblige a lady. And, my word, the locks have been forced. Well, yes. <clears throat> it's a question of loss of memory. I must ask you, sir, to remain here while I fetch the manager. Oh, oh wait, wait, hold on. Uh, here comes the lady who can explain everything. Excuse me. Oh. Uh, I found out who you are. Oh, very interesting. Yeah, you're not a lady at all. I beg your pardon. You're Mrs. Drakmanton, the lady croquet champion. I'm perfectly aware of that. I just lent you ten pounds. Is this man raving mad? And uh, this luggage. Well, it certainly isn't mine. Uh, I know it is. Fetch the manager. Do you mean to say you don't remember me? Would you please let go of my arm? Man's a thief. Uh, look, and I have the key to your room. Help! Fetch the police. Y you asked me to sneak up to your room. What? I I'll be arrested. Arrested? I'll see that, that you're put in a lunatic asylum. I'm harmed. Fetch the police. Well, uh, it's the police. Looking young women who've just gone by, who are they? Ah, uh, those at the Brimley Bone Fields. They have the air of people who have bowed to destiny and are none too sure that the salute will be returned. Even you would look depressed if you'd been through their experiences. I'm always having depressing experiences, but I never give them outward expression. It's as bad as looking one's age. Beauty is only sin deep. Beauty is neither here nor there. Now tell me about the Brimley Bone Fields. Well. The beginning of their tragedy was that they discovered an aunt whose existence they'd completely forgotten. Then some distant relative refreshed their memory by leaving her a lot of money in his will. The aunt, who was poor, became rich, and the Brimley Bonefields grew suddenly concerned at the loneliness of her life. They took her under their wings. The dear old thing had as many wings beating about her as St. Francis of Assisi. <laughs> I failed to see the tragedy for the Brimley Bonefields. Oh, no, that came later. You see, the aunt had been accustomed to living very simply, and her nieces didn't encourage her to make a splash with her money. They had hopes, and I may say, they had grounds for hoping. Why, poor Edward should have left me all that money. I shall never begin to understand. 
I don't deny that I nursed him all through chickenpox. That was a long time ago. I think he gave you no more than your due. So much money. And you must remember that chickenpox was very much more serious in those days than it is now, so mm. it's hardly surprising. I know I'd leave all my money to you, Aunt Amy, if I had any, every penny. Would you, dear? So would I. Oh, but I think you're doing far too much for me already. Bringing me here to live with you, I can hardly believe it's happening. Christine and I are going to look after you from now on. Yes, but I feel I should do something in return. An evening out for all of us. Dinner at a good restaurant. Not her, perhaps. Isn't she kind? No, Aunt Amy. It's very nice of you, but we prefer the simple life. As you do, too. Oh, but I have all this money, and I don't see why I shouldn't spend some of it. After all, that's what it's there for. No, it isn't. Christine means you mustn't go squandering it. On us, that is. It wouldn't do for us to acquire expensive tastes we couldn't afford, and all on your account. Oh, I don't know. Perhaps before very long. Yes? Shall I tell you a great secret? Yes, do. Yes. This afternoon, I went to see Mr. Throckleside. Your solicitor? Mm -hmm. I'm remembering you in my will. Oh, Aunt Amy, oh, you shouldn't. Isn't she good, Christine? Mm. There, it's out. When I go, you'll both be provided for. Oh, it's comforting to think one can repay kindnesses, even though it is from the next world. But that won't be for years yet, we hope. You'll each inherit a quarter of everything. A quarter? Of everything. Two quarters make a half. Aunt Amy? Yes, that's right, dear. And the rest, the half goes to dear Roger. Roger? Oh, you know Roger. On your poor late uncle's side of the family. But you can't seriously be thinking of leaving your money to him. Oh, only half, dear. And he was so good to me when your uncle died. He visited me every week without fail. But he's unspeakable, a rotter. He gambles. And drinks. And he spends thrift. He throws money away. Oh, then he can't be very well off, can he, dear? Oh, you mustn't be too hard on Roger. There's a lot of good in him. And I intend to show him I haven't forgotten. I'm dead. But Aunt Amy. Good night, dear Veronica. Good night, Auntie. Good night, dear. Good night, Auntie. Oh, I'm so happy to feel that everything's all arranged. <laughs> Oh, thank you, dear. Good night. Good night, Auntie. Well, if that isn't the last straw, leaving all that perfectly she's good money... She's not to going to. But she is. You heard her. She's I know what you said, Christine. There's nothing at all the matter with my hearing. Obviously, Aunt Amy has been taken in. It's up to us to save her. Half of that money for each of us would be a lot better than a measly quarter. The money doesn't enter into it. If she wished to leave it to some worthy person, I wouldn't raise the slightest objection. But that ruffian, he'd throw it away on gambling and drink. They tell me that once he even went to India for the Calcutta sweepstakes that one hears so much about. Oh, disgusting. How could Aunt Amy rest peacefully in her grave? She couldn't. But what are we going to do? She must be made to see that Rodra is completely unworthy. We must open her eyes. Yes. But how? How indeed. Aunt Amy would hear nothing against the ruffianly Roger. Or at least she heard a great deal. Her nieces made sure of that. But she paid no attention. At last, Veronique was obliged to resort to extreme measures. Ah, they killed Roger. No, nothing of the sort. Mm. They took their aunt to Dieppe. Dieppe? What an extraordinary thing to do. Not at all. You see, Roger was there. And the Brimley Bonefields were intent on opening Auntie's eyes. Faites vos jeux, messieurs. Les jeux sont faits. Rien ne va plus. Et le neuf gagne. Neuf rouge en perpasse. Rien ne va plus. Un grand rouge. For heaven's sake, Christine, sit up straight and try not to look so miserable. I feel miserable. I keep thinking of the money. Aunt Amy's? No, ours. And I think what this is costing us... Red upon the waters. That may be. But I do think you might have let Aunt Amy pay for herself. Certainly not. So long as she's under an obligation to us, we're certain of our inheritance. It'll all be worth it. You'll see. It had better be. Oh, my dears, that poor little number eight hasn't won for the last 32 times. I've been keeping count. Are you enjoying yourself, Aunt Amy? Oh, very much, dear. It's all so exciting. I never dreamt such a holiday was possible. But I must put five francs on him just to encourage him. Come and watch the dancing, dear. Yes, very well, dear. But first, I must put five francs on number eight. Uh, I, I think you have my bag, Christine. 
Thank you, dear. Oh, isn't Patricia Bo exciting? Oh, I think so. Oh, we did say we were only going to watch. Chance for monsieur. Did you chance for madame. <laughs> for la madame. Mais je sens faire rien de vaste, fais attention à ce qu'il faut, elle a huit cas. Oh, I won, I won. Quarante pour madame. Thirty-five cents, that's nearly thirty shillings. My very first time and I won. Why don't you have to I don't feel the least bit guilty. Aunt Amy? It is Aunt Amy. Roger! Oh, what a lovely surprise. But what are you doing here? Oh, we're not half as well as you by the look of things. You're spreading your wings, aren't you? Girls, isn't this the most amazing coincidence? Your cousin Roger. Well, I'll be blowed. It's the Brimley Bonefields. Hello, Verony, Christine. How do you do? Come over for a spot of hell raising on the quiet, eh? You're a couple of dark horses. Veronique and Christine are giving me a wonderful holiday. Let's go, Aunt Amy. I can see that Roger can't wait to have his little wager. You do still gamble, Roger. Yes, I like a flutter now and again, but not a petit chevaux. That's a bit on the tame side. I always say if you want to bet on a horse, bet on a real horse. Yes, we've heard that's what you always say. Come along, Auntie. I wonder if I ought to try number eight just once more. Oh, no, but you I must. Think... That's the way to make money, Aunt Amy. When your luck is in, you must follow it. Should I? Aunt Amy, uh, you didn't come here to gamble. Oh, just once more, Veronique, then we'll all go and watch the dance here, I promise. Now she can see what a rotter Roger is with her own eyes. And that was the object of our bringing her to dear. How do we expect her to disapprove of Roger gambling if we let her do the same thing? I can't stop her. It's her money. Our money, you mean. Aunt Amy, how do you stand them? Stand whom, Roger? There's all for Brimley Bonefields. Look at them. They look as miserable as two chickens that have just been hatched out by a duck. <laughs> Roger, but they're dear sweet girls and they're being so good to me. Later, so fair. Rien ne va plus. Attention, les petits chevaux. Elle le huit gagne de nouveau. Oh, 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 I won't. I won't. You're you on a winning streak, oh, Aunt Amy. You must go and play. Should I? Yeah, they're beginning to look a bit impatient. Oh, oh well, well, just one more. Huit. Oh, oh, oh. Here we don't go. <laughs> <laughs> we should never have left her with him. It was better to come away than to sit there making fools of ourselves. What time is it? Long after midnight. Do you think they can still be gambling? I don't see why not. I knew Roger was a ruffian. What I didn't know was that he was so evil. Doesn't look as though your idea is going to work. She likes gambling. Well, only because she's won. Let her lose a few pounds and she'll very soon change her opinion. That's when she'll begin to see Roger in his true colors. And she marvelous two thousand francs down, and she acts as though she's winning. Did you say? Two thousand? You know, you girls really are the most incorrigible gamblers. We're not gambling, we're watching. Now, 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 I know better. It's your money. What? Of course it is. You can't hoodwink your Uncle Roger. You two girls are a syndicate, and Auntie is merely putting the stakes on for you. Anyone can see you've got an interest in the game. Every time she loses, it's written all over your faces. Bad water, monsieur. Oh, how very kind. <laughs> Oh! That's it. Have I lost? Oh, I've ah, lost I again. <laughs> oh, dear, you hardly see me going, do you? But still, I, I have some more friends here, just in case. Please. You all right? A glass of water? I have a headache. I think perhaps if I went back to my hotel and lay down. Oh, then you won't be able to come to supper with us. And auntie's invited dozens of interesting people. Dozens? Well, you can't play roulette and not meet people, you know. You should become quite extraordinarily popular here. Would you be good enough to call us a carriage? Of course. She's invited dozens to supper. <laughs> dozens! Yeah. <laughs> Aunt Amy, 
Veronique and I are going. Yes, she am. Veronique has been taken ill. It may be serious. Yes, dear, have a good time. our inheritance, but she's taking half of Dieppe to supper. Oh, she's worse than Roger ever was. But the season is almost over. Season? It doesn't go on forever, you know. Next week the casinos will be closed and Aunt Amy will have to come home with us. And even she can't lose everything in a week. Oh, can't she? She's gone gambling mad. Oh, it's true what they say. Show a cat the way to the dairy at Hansico. Oh, we need only wait one more week, dear. Oh, please, Veronique. It's not for me. It's for the money. Oh, Veronique. Roger says you're not feeling very well. I had a headache. It was nice of you to worry, oh, Aunt. I was just on my way to supper, and I thought I'd just drop round to see if there was anything I could do. But as Christine's looking after you. Oh, I think we shall manage very well. You mustn't keep your friends waiting. Oh, no, I mustn't. I, I do feel rather guilty. But then, as it's our last week here, I thought we might as well make the most of it. Yes, that's just what I was telling Veronique. Oh, I shall be sorry to leave, dear Dieppe. But they tell me that Monte is even more exciting. Monte? Yes, yes, short for Monte Carlo. They say the casino there is very nice. Aunt Amy, Christine and I are leaving in the morning for England. Oh, well, yes, dear, I think you're wise. It's time you went home and had those horrible headaches seen to by a specialist. Your friends will be growing impatient. Oh, yes. Well, I'll see you before you leave. Oh, it is a pity. But then it isn't everyone that foreign travel agrees with, you know. It is indeed a tragedy. I told you it was. But what happened to her? Aunt Amy, I mean. Oh, she lives in Monte Carlo, on uh, various moneylenders. Or oh, the Brimley Bonefields get an occasional picture postcard. I gather the old thing is thoroughly enjoying herself. As happy as a cat in a dairy. <laughs> Since I tend to dislike humanity, I've always had a special weakness for murderers. Oh, for any particular murderer? I'm not certain whether the hero of this story of 40 odd years ago is a small boy whom I shall call uh, Conradin, or a ferret, a large polecat ferret who was in fact called Conradin was 10 years old. And the doctor had pronounced his professional opinion that the boy would not live for another five years. The doctor was silky and effete and counted for little. But his opinion was endorsed by Mrs. de Ropp, who counted for very nearly everything. Mrs. de Ropp was Conradin's cousin and guardian, and in his eyes, she represented those three-fifths of the world that are necessary and disagreeable and real. Breakfast has been waiting for exactly seven and a half minutes. I was just coming down. You really must try to remember, Conrad, and the punctuality is the politeness of princes. Yes, cousin. I hope your toothache is better. Oh, thank you, Conrad. After three nights of excruciating agony, the pain is quite gone. There is something I must ask you, Conrad. Hilda reports a periodic disappearance from the kitchen of large quantities of powdered nutmeg. I should be loath to think that you were in any way associated with this, um, pilfering, are you? No, cousin. I have your word of honour on that. You have my word of honour. Mm. May I go down to breakfast now, please? In a moment. You must know, Conradin, that as your guardian, I am responsible for your welfare, both spiritual and physical. Yes, cousin. And that I always do everything for your own good. Yes, cousin. That being the case, I must confess I am very deeply concerned about the amount of time you spend in that tool shed at the bottom of the garden. You are very far from strong, Conradin, and I feel that it can't be healthy for you to be pottering down there in all weathers. 
I have to. Uh, Conrad, you know what the doctor has said. Yes, Conrad. But we must try to keep you alive for as long as possible. I have to go down to the shed to look after my pet black hen. Uh, that will no longer be necessary. I sold the hen. It was taken away last night. I felt it to be my duty, Conradin. Yes, cousin. Well, now I have a little surprise for you. A treat. You shall have toast for tea this afternoon. Oh, I know it's probably very bad for you, which is why I always forbid it normally. And I have no doubt that Hilda will grumble because of all the extra work she will have to do. But toast you shall have. You like toast, don't you? Sometimes. Well, you better go and have your breakfast now. And don't forget to apologize to Hilda for being so late. Shredni Vashta the Beautiful. I come bearing gifts, O Shredni Vashta. Spice from the Mystic East. Powdered nutmeg. Now I know thou art a god who shred me faster. A boon I asked of thee, and it was granted. Three nights thou didst inflict the woman with pangs of pain, to wit, toothache. Three nights thou didst meet out to her condign punishment, as requested. She took my hen away, shred me faster. She took it away and sold it into captivity. It was my Anabaptist. I'm not quite sure what an Anabaptist is, but I'm sure it's something rather dashing and not quite respectable. The woman sold my Anabaptist. It wasn't much of a hen, really. Its feathers were ragged and it had something wrong with one eye. But I loved it, you see. Shredney Vashta went full. His thoughts were red thoughts and his teeth were white. His enemies called for peace, but he brought them death. Shredni Vashta the Beautiful. His enemies called for peace, but he brought them death. Shredni Vashta the Beautiful. Do one thing for me, Shredni Vashta. Thou art a god and know what is in my mind. Do one thing for me, Shredni Vashta. One thing. Master Conradin? milk, Conradin, and as much toast as you could possibly wish for. I'm sure the doctor wouldn't approve, and of course Hilda is grumbling because of all the extra work she's got to do. However, a promise is a promise. And once given, it must be adhered to. An admirable rule, which I hope you will follow throughout life. Though I am very disappointed in you, Conradin. Sometimes it seems that you deliberately and willfully go out of your way to disregard my wishes. I thought I made it perfectly clear this morning how much I objected to your shutting yourself up in that tool shed. And yet, almost before the words were out of my mouth, you go out and you do exactly that. I'm sorry. I'm afraid I can't believe that, Conrad. And I'm afraid you forced me to do something that I had hoped would not be necessary. But you're still keeping something in that hutch, aren't you? Yes. I believe it's guinea pigs. Very well, then. I shall go and clear them all away this very minute. 
Tread me, Vashto went forth. His thoughts were red thoughts, and his teeth were white. His enemies called for peace, but he brought them death. Shredni Vashta the beautiful, do one thing for me, Shredni Vashta. Do one thing for me, Shredni Vashta. Shredni Vashta, Shredni Vashta! Shredni Vashta went forth. His thoughts were red thoughts and his teeth were white. Oh, yes, we'll break it to the poor child. His enemies called oh, for peace, but he brought them death. Oh, the poor child. Shred me, Vashta the beautiful. Hmm. Forty years ago. You say the boy's name was Conradin, Sir Hector? I see Amblecope approaching. I've avoided speaking with him for over a year now. Perhaps my luck will hold. One doesn't speak with him, one is spoken to. Yes, my season of immunity may be coming to an end. I'll be honest in a moment. Mouth ready mobilized for conversational openings. <laughs> Forgive me. I'd rather be bored by my own company than by that past master in the art of boring. Retreat in the face of the enemy. You're a better man than I, Sir Hector. I cannot argue with you on that point. Hello, Amblecope. Do take my chair. Oh, thank you, young man. Hector. You seen the portrait in the hair of Prossel Wings, Sir Hector? No. Reminds me a little bit of Yellowstone, the one the Grand Prix in 1903. Be kind enough never to mention the Grand Prix in my hearing. It awakes acutely distressing memories. The Grand Prix? Why? I cannot explain why without going into a long and complicated story. Oh. Oh well. Why, say, there's a mighty good representation of a Mongolian peasant there. <laughs> yeah, they, they take some stopping when they're fairly on the wing. I, I suppose the, the best bag I ever made... My was aunt, who owns the greater part of Lincolnshire, possesses the most remarkable record in the way of a pheasant bag that has ever been achieved in the field of sport. Your aunt? Yes. She's 75 and she can't hit a thing, but she always goes out with the guns. Oh, rum way to behave. When I say that she can't hit a thing, I don't mean to say that she doesn't sometimes endanger the lives of her fellow guns. In fact, the chief government whip won't allow cabinet ministers to go out with her. As she says, we don't want to incur by-elections needlessly. <laughs> as erratic as that, eh? Exactly. Well, the other day, she managed to wing an old pheasant and bring it to earth for the loss of a feather or two. It was a runner, and my aunt saw herself in danger of being done out of the only bird that she'd managed to hit during the present rain. So what did she do? I remember once back in... She followed it, out. and when it made for the open field, she jumped onto the shooting pony and went after it. It was a long chase through bracken and brushwood and across ploughed fields, and when eventually my aunt ran the pheasant to a standstill, she realised that she'd left the shooting party some five miles behind her. And she went on after it, and she was the president of the Young Women's Christian Association, upon whose authority the story rests. Oh, really? Yes. Well, it was a rather a long run At this her... point, she realized that she was nearer home than she was to the shooting party. So she trotted the pony on to her house. And it wasn't until the middle of the afternoon that it was discovered that the luncheon for the entire shooting party was in a pannier attached to her pony's saddle. Anyway, she got her bird. Yes, well, uh, some birds are very hard to kill. So some fish. I remember fishing the X once. Lovely trout stream, lots of good fish. Don't have any great size. Oh, of oh, one of them did. I beg your pardon? My uncle, the Bishop of South Milton, came across a giant trout in a pool just off the main stream of the X. He tried it with every kind of fly without any success. Then fate intervened on his behalf. Fate? In what way? There was a low stone bridge running over the pool. Along came a large motor van, struck the bridge, and the entire load was pitched into the water. 
I say, talking of motor accidents, I had a narrow squeak last week motoring with Tommy Yarby no and North was hurt. But within a couple of minutes, the giant trout was twisting and flapping on the bare mud at the bottom of a waterless pool, and my uncle was able to walk in and fold it to his breast. I don't understand. Why was the pool empty? The van load consisted entirely of blotting paper. Blotting paper? It soaked up every drop of water in that pool. Oh, 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 that doesn't seem possible. Doesn't it? I say, you going in to dinner? I think so. Oh, jolly good idea. I'll join you. I think I take precedence. You're merely the club bore. I am the club liar. Our short season devoted to the work of Philip Mackey continues next Saturday with Maupassant. A theme of women and money links three stories of a bargain wife. I said to him, if she was new, it'd be different, but she's not. She's second hand. A costly death. Uh, three days, four francs worth. And an ill-behaved corpse. The devil does this mean. The telegram said that the old woman was as dead as mutton. Quiet, she's was going to pay our train fares. That's what I'd like to know. The Stories of Maupassant, next Saturday at 9 o'clock. <laughs>